We all wish we could start working with lumber right off the sawmill, but there's a very important step that follows to make sure our lumber is of good quality. That's the drying process. Let's take a look. So, Dan, once your lumber is off the mill, that's when the real fun starts, right? That's absolutely correct, and that's the most important part. I can't emphasize it enough. That's the most important part of the process, because we've gone through all this process of 60, 70, 80 years to grow a tree. We've dug it out of the woods. We've got all that investment in it. We've got it up on the mill. We've just cut lumber out of it. We've got that investment in it. Mm -hmm. And now we have to be very, very careful, particularly depending on the time of the year, as to how we're going to properly uh, dry that lumber. Some lumber is used green, industrial blocking, pallet stock, those sorts of items are used green so you don't have to worry about drying. But if it's going to be for interior millwork, mm -hmm. uh, interior furniture, even outside siding, soffit work, that sort of thing, it should be at least air dried uh, for exterior applications down to 12 to 15 percent in this part of the country. And uh, uh, for kiln dried stock, it should be down to 6 to 8 percent moisture contents. So those are the numbers we're shooting at and that's on an oven-dry basis for the lumber itself. Okay. And including the inside of the piece. Mm -hmm. So uh, with air drying, what are, what are we trying to accomplish there? I think with air drying, you're trying to get the bulk of the moisture out of that lumber in a cheap sort of way. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature's doing the drying for you. You just have to try to keep control of her in the process some. Uh, but you're trying to get the moisture content down. That improves the strength of the wood, uh, reduces the weight of the wood, and uh, reduces any possibilities of uh, stain infection, stain and mold problems. Sure. It does not stop powder post beetles. What we're looking at here is powder post beetle damage and typically what you'll see is the real fine dust that is kicked out of the holes where the insect is in the wood and boring away. Uh, it's the larvae that's in the wood that's doing the boring. The larvae eventually mature into beetles and the beetles exit out of the hole leaving the hole behind and go either back into the same piece again or somewhere else to continue to do the damage. Uh, the beetle will be a very small, usually a little black insect, about a sixteenth to no more than an eighth of an inch long. We all know about what the problem is, but uh, what can we do about this particular problem? Uh, the traditional uh, industry approach is to heat this lumber uh, up into the higher temperatures. The, the problem with the beetle is that he's in the wood, or the larvae is in the wood, and you can't get poison to him. The beetles don't affect the heartwood of most species. I don't think I've ever seen them in the heartwood of any of the different species that we've got here locally in the Midwest, uh, but they do affect the sapwood. Uh, so if you happen to get some, get an infection, and you got a little bit of sapwood on a piece, I just rip that sapwood right off of there and save the heartwood, and uh, you're not going to see them again. I've had some people that think holes in wood in lumber are unique and a good thing that they want to work with. Uh, so if you want some of that, come see me. <laughs> the amount of time to air dry a lumber is a very difficult answer, very difficult question to answer, because it depends on the time of the year. Mm -hmm. The fastest drying time is probably in the fall of the year. We get these fall winds through here. We get temperatures up to 60, 70 degrees, and you can actually surface check oak in an air drying pile, thick oak. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will use burlap or shade cloth to protect uh, lumber that's exposed outside to those pretty severe drying conditions. You get into the winter time, drying practically stops. You down below freezing, you know, sure. the water is ice. It's not it's going hard, anywhere. Hard to move out and it's not going to go very far. Come spring of the year, you have these on and off days, on and off weeks where you, you get some air movement, you get some warm temperature. Uh, drying is a little bit slower at that point, uh, but still going on. And then you get in the summer, you got the same sort of thing going on and you have an elevated temperature, and we all know that elevated temperatures make water evaporate faster and put some wind behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, that improves the process even further. The other thing about air dried lumber is once it's air dried at that point, it's pretty hard to hurt it in a kiln. Okay. You don't have to be so careful with it. You put green oak in a kiln, and you better be right on, right on the spot, and you better not have any variation in that kiln or you're gonna, you're gonna ruin it. So uh, we're here uh, in, in one of your drying areas and we've got some stacks of lumber here, but I understand that stacking lumber in the correct manner is really important too. Absolutely, to uh, stacking lumber. The first thing that you need to look for is a good sound foundation. Mm -hmm. And we happen to be in a repurposed ag building here, so I had cheap concrete to work with. And uh, I have uh, six by sixes, they could be bigger, particularly if you're outside. Uh, so you're up off that rainwater splash area like to keep that lumber up above that. But uh, these bolsters underneath here, this footing uh, is all tied together so it stays square. And I'm on about 18 inch centers here. Uh, 
a lot of a lot of drying is done on 24 inch centers mm -hmm. uh, spreading those stickers further apart so you don't have to use as many uh, I know some pretty traditional industry people that went from 24 to 18 and they said we produce much better lumber because you don't get that sagging warping sure. in between on that 24 inch width uh, and it's also important to do that on species like sycamore and gum and elm mm -hmm. the I wouldn't absolutely would not dry those on anything more than 18 inches uh, sticker spacing because you've got an interlock grain and it'll just twist and warp and you'll be a pretty miserable camper at that point. So uh, let's talk about stickers for a second. What are, what are you using here? Well, I use a lot of off-fall and particularly if you're cutting eight-quarter stock, um, you can get these uh, typically about an inch and a half to an inch and three-quarters wide by three-quarters of an inch thick uh, by the width of your pile. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm shooting for as, as far as sticks are concerned. Um, I would prefer uh, something like oak. Uh, it's probably a, a traditional species. Hard maples are traditional species. And uh, uh, you can use anything, but those tend to be more resistant to uh, powder post beetle, particularly if you don't get the sapwood included. You get the sapwood included, then you got the opportunity to get beetle infection in those sticks. And it's not a problem if you run into a kiln mm -hmm. and run them over 132 degrees Fahrenheit. You kill everything periodically. You sterilize them. Uh, but when you're just air drying and you don't have those kind of temperatures to work with, uh, you have to be a little bit more careful. And some people, uh, you'll hear people talk about sticker stain. Yep. And that's because uh, there's several reasons for it. One reason is you want these sticks to be dry. You don't want to take fresh lumber that you just cut out there, cut sticks, and use it for air drying because that stick is wet, the board's wet, and where those two interface, if you have poor drying conditions, you'll get mold on the surface or discolor on the surface. And even worse than that, you can get oxidation stain down below that stick in the board. You put a dry stick on wet lumber, sometimes it'll dry that surface off just enough to leave a white mark across mm -hmm. the board like in yellow poplar, and the rest of the board's got stain in it. So you, that's the reverse kind of a sticker mark, but right. you, you don't want that neither. So it's important to have good sticks and dry sticks. Keep me in out of the rain. Don't let them get wet. So, uh, and there's also a little bit of a science to, to stacking your pile, too. Oh, absolutely. You want to keep the stickers. This, this we put, I didn't want this six inch wide piece of wood, even though it's dry, mm -hmm. up against my wet board. So I actually have a, a sticker underneath there, so I get air down through there. And these stickers, these boards should be as close to the ends of the stickers as possible and that prevents deep end checking. Or better yet, they could be end coated with a wax coating mm -hmm. uh, to, to slow down the drying from the end. These boards are drying faster out the ends and that means they shrink here first. And in the process, and this is still fully swollen back here, the process of shrinking, you get that, that crack or that check in there. So you wanna control that as much as you can. Next sticker should be directly above this one, straight across. It's always easier to say as I do, say as I say, do as I say, not, not as I do, mm -hmm. because it's hard to get these stickers straight and keep them straight on both sides of the pile. You drop a board and they bounce and sure. you have to kind of you make do with what I got here in the background. So uh, as far as stacking goes, um, what, what do we do once we have our firm foundation and our first layer of stickers here? Well, one of the, one of the difficulties with these small, smaller mills that cut a variety of lengths and particularly variety of lengths and variety of species of, of lumber is number one you probably want to put all one species together because mm -hmm. this quartered white oak that we've been cutting is going to dry a lot slower than something like the sassafras that we have here or yellow poplar or basswood mm -hmm. those easy to dry species so you want to put your species try to keep your species together so when you pull the pile down you can take what dries first down and get it in the kiln if you're going to do that uh, so that helps. Uh, you want to plan ahead. Really have to plan ahead at that head saw when you're sawing lumber because you, you don't want to have your 8 foot stuff on top if you're cutting 10s and 12s. You want to end up so you got your 12 foot links on top of your stack of lumber. Mm -hmm. So when you go to stack it for air drying, the 12s come off first and go at the bottom of the stack. Or we can box pile it like we're going to show you here in a minute. But I like to put the 12s, that's my longest length that I cut here, unless it's special order, mm -hmm. is uh, cut the, the 12 foot lengths, put them down first, I put my better stock on the bottom. Because we're not having big, tall piles, we're having relatively short piles, so we want to put that weight on those good boards that are on the bottom. So let's, uh, let's stack some of this. Okay, Logan, you gonna give me a hand here? We've got two 12 footers laid out here, one on each edge of the pile to help keep that pile square. Mm -hmm. We've got a little, uh, 
depending on what we do with it. We got a little eight or ten footer here. Uh, I, I usually butt these boards up tight edge to edge. Some people try to leave a space in there thinking it helps with drying. I don't think it makes any difference. Okay. Uh, then we usually put a long one in the middle, about like that, trying to keep that back as far as we can. And then we'll take another short piece. Now that short piece is, is moving, being moved to the other end here. All right. And so, so why is that? Well, we'll stagger. When we come back with the second course now, we'll put our stickers in. Now, we still got a board over here, but we'll put our stickers in like this, and we'll put the next 10-footer down here. Okay. Or a 12-footer. So we, we move those blank spaces around to balance the, the load, so to speak, on the pile. Mm -hmm. And you could be putting fours in here. You could put three fours in here. Sure. Or two sixes. So that's why 12s work out really well. Uh, it's a good deal. And uh, so we'd probably take this next 10 and we're a little bit short on room here. That's the other, that should go down here. Okay. Uh, so we really need more like a, we can move this out a little bit. We still got room to do that. We won't hurt anything. Should come Bring it all the way room. down here. Yeah, I think so. So that leaves the two blank spaces down there and one down here. And uh, then the next thing we do is just lay our stickers down. And then we'd come back with another course of boards. Uh, if we got them available, we'd lay our three long links in to mm -hmm. control the pile and then start staggering the, the shorter 10-foot and 8-foot stock if we want to go that way. And then I like the bigger the pile, the taller the pile, the more weight you got. So that tends to keep that lumber flatter. So I try to make these piles as high as I can as I can reach manually, mm -hmm. but the more traditional bigger mills will be, well, they'll be 30 feet tall <laughs> out there. So you got all that weight and cherry's a bad reactor. Okay. Uh, cherry, sapwood, those were just about all these universally cup. Mm -hmm. And I like my better lumber, as I said earlier, I like my better lumber on the bottom if I can do that and work on up. And then on the top, I usually put the miscellaneous material and then try to put some sort of weight on top of that. And if you're outside, like we would be over here, mm -hmm. uh, I find that tin works well for a cover. And you can nail those up into things you can pick up with a forklift and put on top of your pile. You can put individual sheets up there and then get whatever product you got on top of that for weight. Metal is probably best. Mm -hmm. Concrete blocks tend to spald and you want to be really careful so you don't rub one of those blocks on a piece of lumber because that grit gets ground in at that point. Sure. And we know what that's going to do down the road. Yeah. So Dan, uh, measuring your lumber as it's drying is an important part of the process. Oh yes, absolutely and important and critical because you, with all the variables involved, the weather conditions, the species variables, the stacking variables, um, size variables, thickness variables, it's impossible just to give an answer as to how long <laughs> should that lumber be out there air sure. drying. Uh, so what you can do uh, is you can measure it. Uh, people, a lot of people know that we have these moisture meters. Uh, there's about three companies that manufacture these meters. Um, this is a handy one here, one of the earliest ones made. Not this one, but the company is one of the earliest ones. And uh, it's got a little 3 8 inch pins on the end. And so, and it's cal you can calibrate it for time, for temperature, uh, for species. Uh, those are your two important factors. And you just come along and you stick this these probes into the edge of the lumber or you can do it in the face if you want to. Yeah, that's well air dried stock and I've had fans on this lumber trying to hurry it along a little bit. Uh, so that's good air dried stock. Uh, back on 623 it was reading 20 percent and on 614 it was reading 14 percent. So we're down here at the end of July now so and uh, it's, I started writing these numbers on the boards because you can't, you write on a piece of paper, a piece of paper disappears. You write it on the board, you pretty well got it at that point. And uh, so that's well air dried lumber. Now the thing about this though, is that if you do thick lumber or even this uh, lumber right here that's only four quarter, they make these two inch probes and this hammer on it, which you don't want to get your fingers in there. And you drive that in particularly on eight-quarter lumber. You have to do it on eight-quarter lumber. You dry that in and you get off the surface moisture content. Uh, 
be sure not to leave your pins in the wood. Do that about like that. Now, just for the fun of it, we had what? 10.7? 10.8? 10 10 10 10.8. Yep. So we're now at 12.4. So that demonstrates the movement of water out of these boards from the surface to the inside. So the closer you are to the outside, the drier it'll the probably drier be. It'll probably be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you said these are almost ready to go? These are ready to go. They're past ready. So, and you're going to put these in the kiln then? These will go in the kiln and I'll try to get it down to about 7% moisture content. And then the thing to remember is that even once I get it down to that 7% moisture content, it has to stay at a certain temperature and relative humidity to stay there. Mm -hmm. Because if I dry this lumber in the kiln and stick it back out here, it'll be right back up to 12%. And if I look down this chart at about 70 degrees, mm -hmm. 70 to 80 degrees, and I scoot over here to 35% relative humidity, I'm at 7% moisture content roughly. And uh, that's where kiln dried lumber should be and that's where it should be kept. You're looking for, you're trying to get that wood at the average moisture content that it's going to be in service at. And that's six to eight in most of our houses. Mm -hmm. You ship it to Las Vegas, Nevada, and what's going to happen? Go down a little. A lot of pretty high end manufacturers have learned on their big conference tables <laughs> that you don't try it to 8% and ship it to Las Vegas because it's probably going to come back home. This is a small uh, homemade kiln uh, that I use. And uh, the first thing to point out, I think, is the, uh, the structure in the back where a stick actually lays in, into that groove, like right there. And then you can line up this end. So those ends are perfectly straight, and that's the way you want them. And you have, as, the, as you load the kiln, you have to try to keep them straight here in the front. This also shows the box piling technique, where there's long lumber and short lumber staggered in together and staggered across the top and bottoms of the pile. Uh, there's a plenum in the back and a plenum in the front that's supposed to allow the air movement through there. There's some studies done on how, um, how wide those plenums should be, particularly in big commercial kilns. Those numbers are all worked out, but for small applications like this, they're, they're seldom uh, known. You just try to leave an access door in the back so if something goes wrong with your equipment, you can, you can get in there to service it. Uh, you put your dehumidification uh, uh, equipment somewhere's in there and let it run and have room for water drainage. Uh, the other thing that's important is uh, we have overhead fans up here. Just cheap fans and that hangs down. Lumber will be stacked up to this level or even a little bit higher and weights put on it and uh, the fans turned on and the fans are pointed one direction to them or one direction to them or the other direction. So you're reversing your fan speed. So you try to keep it as uniform as you can. Now in this particular charge that's going in the scale, I'm about two feet short. I've only got 10 foot lumber. Uh, so when this gets filled, I'll block that off with a piece of plywood. Because if you don't, that air will all short circuit around the end of that pile. And you'll dry the ends of the lumber out faster than you'll dry the rest of it out. There, there's, if you just got a small amount of lumber, uh, uh, or a large amount. I mean, you need a kiln. That's the best way to do it. But I tell people if they got, you know, a guy comes out and he's got 500 board feet of lumber cut and he wants to use it. Well, if he puts it in his heated garage on sticks and puts fans on it, he will eventually dry that lumber down to the proper moisture content. And you can also just drape it with uh, plastic or some sort of tarp, stick a DH unit in underneath there. That DH unit gives off heat and gives off quite a bit of heat if anybody's ever looked at them. And that raises the temperature of that wood. You got a little, and you might put a fan or two in there. You got a little air circulation going on and you'll bring it down to seven, eight percent moisture content. But you should be measuring it. You shouldn't be, shouldn't be guessing. While we wait for our lumber to dry, let's take a look at calculating yield and the grading process in the next section on getting the lumber ready for market.